Thank you so much for that. I hope we can do justice to all that you've uh, outlined over the next hour. Before I begin, I'd also like to give a shout out to the Internet Freedom Foundation gang. You guys are have been working relentlessly in the space of data privacy, and uh, we really need voices like yours to amplify this and to make this an issue for everyone, not just a small group of people. Um, may I also introduce, of course, our guest for the next hour, Dr. Shashi Tharoor, who does not need any introduction, but uh, let me give it a crack anyway, Member of Parliament and most importantly, Chairman of the Parliamentary Standing Committee on Information Technology, which is why his voice will lend a lot of weight to this conversation. For those joining in, I just want to take a second to set some context to our conversation, which will largely circle around Pegasus, which as Apar, uh, you know, very diplomatically put it, has put a bit of a setback to the whole conversation about privacy this year. In July this year itself, a group of about 17 media organizations came together on what they called the Pegasus Project. Essentially, these organizations did a deep dive and a huge amount of research to reveal that the spyware Pegasus, uh, based out of Israel or a company in Israel, was actually being planted systematically across the world. In India itself, there were more than 300 names that came up that included politicians, activists, lawyers, uh, and many ordinary citizens as well, quite surprisingly. Um, the other important point I'd like to put across about Pegasus is that this is treated as military grade spyware. We're not talking about the tapping of phones, we're talking about a far more serious offense. At this point, the government of India has stated that they have not voluntarily um, purchased any such software. However, I would like to juxtapose that with the fact that the Israeli firm themselves have said that they sell the Pegasus spyware only to quote unquote vetted governments. Um, investigations are already underway in countries like France, but what about the road for India? More importantly, let's divide this conversation into a couple of parts. What does it mean for privacy? What does it mean for democracy and electoral process? And most importantly, to my mind, what are the remedies in place at this point? Dr. Tharoor, you're going to be in the hot seat now for the next hour or so. Uh, let me start with a little bit of context, sir, where, you know, these revelations are from July, but some of this goes back to 2019, where vulnerabilities were found in WhatsApp uh, itself, and the Pegasus spyware was detected. That did go to your standing committee at that point, sir. What happened of it? And, you know, can you bring us up to speed for everyone who's joined in on where investigations are progressing? All right, let me start off by saying one thing with Dali, which I need to for the record, though I am chairman of the IT committee, I'm not speaking in that capacity. It's very important to stress that because there have been some ructions, uh, as you probably know, within and around the committee. And I want to make it very clear, I'm not pretending to speak for other members, nor indeed in principle, do we discuss internal discussions of the committee until such time as a report has been submitted to parliament. So I'm Speaking as somebody who's interested in the issue, who's aware of it, who's conscious of it, and who has individual views, and I, I speak to my individual views. So that's something I should, I should lay out right on top. Now, on 2019, uh, that immediately ties my hands, and I can't reveal what goes on. But I think what's openly known that I can confirm is that when um, the Toronto uh, Citizens Lab wrote to a number of people in India stating that they had been compromised through their WhatsApp accounts by a spyware called Pegasus. A number of them wrote to me as chairman of the committee. And I decided to invite them to testify before the committee at fairly short notice. Um, but they came, we had representatives, we had about three or four representatives from different um, victims as it were of the 20 odd people who had received letters saying they'd been compromised. Um, I think again, it's fairly well known that uh, the ruling parties, members of the committee who actually constitute a majority, uh, yes. tried to prevent a discussion. Uh, witnesses were kept waiting for a couple of hours, two and a half hours, while they argued the subject uh, was not appropriate for the committee to discuss, which was a mind boggling position to take, given that it was on our agenda under the heading citizens, data, privacy, and security. Can't be more explicit than that. But, um, Matters came to a head, there were detailed discussions, a, a vote finally had to be called, and uh, the vote was finally settled, 12-12 uh, in favor and against the discussion, with me as the chairman casting a second and casting vote 
to permit discussion. And we then had these witnesses come in and testify to us. And then we called in the government's witnesses and asked them to clarify. Because, you know, it's important to understand that interception, as interception is legal, placing malware is not, and I'll explain both of those in a minute. And there is, under the inter interception consideration, it is legal uh, to invoke a sort of national security uh, reason for the government to either not address an issue or to explain why they've done something. Um, I must say that in two separate sessions, uh, spread over a few weeks, uh, we were unable to get any clarity on whether anybody in the government, central government at least, knew whether Pegasus had been ordered, paid for, or deployed. Uh, and uh, no one sought a national security exemption. In fact, no one sought uh, any, uh, anything at all, frankly, other than to say that they had no idea. And we're talking about the Secretary of IT, the Home Secretary, though he, in fact, could not wait for the the committee to thrash out whether it was going to discuss matters, so he sent the additional secretary, but nonetheless a person with um, knowledge of this. And the bottom line at the end of it all was we had no clarity on the issue. Now, why was this not reported promptly to parliament? Because it's the topic that had to, we had to conclude discussions on. And citizens' data, privacy, and security involved a number of other issues that were still being discussed. And until all the discussions were over, a report cannot be drafted, then thrashed out and agreed upon, and then submitted to parliament. And then what happened with, um, with uh, these other topics? Well, really, frankly, uh, the, um, the committee never quite finished discussing them. When the Pegasus scandal erupted again in the middle of this year, that is in July uh, of this year, uh, we again, I again as chairman, summoned them to attend. And again, two things happened, uh, both quite extraordinary and both widely reported, so I'm not revealing anything indiscreet. The first is that the um, 19 people turned up for the meeting, of whom 10 were members of the BJP, who sat in their chairs, spoke, but refused to sign the attendance register, thereby depriving the meeting of a quorum. The quorum, um, in our committee is 10 people. That is one third of the total membership. We have 31 members, two seats are vacant, so 29 divided by three, the next highest number, 10. And we don't have 10, we had nine who wanted a discussion that had come for it. But for good measure, the three government witnesses, the three secretaries to government who were to testify, all found excuses 15 minutes before the event to send urgent messages saying they couldn't come. Uh, which I promptly reported to the Speaker of the Lok Sabha as little short of contempt of the House. Now, that's the, the full background, the overall story as to why uh, we've had this. But I, 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 I'm happy to clarify, since I mentioned very briefly, uh, if you're interested, Natalia, on why it is possible to intercept but not possible to, to implant spyware under the law and, and what the law provides. So should we go into that? I would like to delve into that in just a second, but let me ask oh. your personal capacity then, Dr. Tharoor, whether uh, the revelations of July by the wire here in India lend much more credence to the issue. Because, you know, there was a feeling from 2019 that there was, there was, the, there was a little bit of back and forth, there was discussion and debate, and then the issue was almost brushed under the carpet. There, there is a feeling of frustration amongst those who are watching this carefully, that perhaps everyone is complicit and the inaction is almost deliberate, uh, which is why I'm asking you in your personal capacity, given the revelations of July, do you believe that there is now a far more concrete case to be looked at in terms of spyware and what's that that is doing to the privacy rights of individual citizens? So, uh, yes, I mean, I personally had no doubt on either occasion that um, the issue warranted serious investigation and discussion. Um, on the first one, the targets were one specific category of individuals, namely human rights activists of various descriptions and of various ages and seniority, uh, specifically caught up in matters related to uh, what the government would normally characterize as left-wing extremism, the Bhimalkara Koregaon case, and so on. And therefore, the balance of probability was indeed that they were targeted 
by the authorities, either center or state, and there was a specific um, motive for so targeting them. But the new revelations of this year pointed in a far broader and more searching direction. Why? Because obviously the list of targets identified by the investigation conducted by the wire here and I think 16 outlets around the world, 16 media outlets around the world, specifically pointed to a range of people of political as opposed to any other kind of interest. That is, you find names like, uh, like Prasant Kishore, the election campaign manager of the uh, chief minister of West Bengal, during the very time that the election campaign in Bengal is being fought, and he submits his phone for analysis to the Amnesty uh, Lab, and it's confirmed that he was hacked as recently as the day that he submitted the phone. Uh, Rahul Gandhi, who is a who is the, the leading figure of the principal opposition party, um, other individuals uh, of of political uh, connection, Mamta Banerjee's nephew, some aides, and so on, um, people associated with the ruling party, including two ministers. Now that seemed more peculiar, though you can always imagine there are multiple motives for checking and you don't have to have such suspicions as such. You may simply want to vet somebody the way in which the American FBI vets a cabinet appointee before he's appointed, perhaps something like that is going on. Who knows? And then you've got 40 journalists. Now why 40 journalists? It turned out they're all people who are interviewing various opposition figures in our political space. And so the assumption was it's the kind of stories they were reporting and more important, the people they were speaking to who were of interest. Now this of course um, is rather alarming because our democracy uh, can't function on the basis that the ruling party can use taxpayers' money to deploy such uh, devices for its narrow, political information gathering, and therefore it's narrow partisan advantage. If that's going on, then we have already, forget about a level playing field, terribly skewed um, the uh, arena within which the various other political interests in our country are competing for attention, for space, for power. And therefore, that's, that's fundamentally worrying. Secondly, if they can tap such a large array of people because they have the resources that others don't have, then of course, no Indian citizen is truly safe. You may not be of interest last month, but you may be of interest next month. And therefore, everyone uh, who, who's listening to this uh, has every reason to be concerned. Now, again, I should stress, we cannot officially determine that this has been done by our government. There has been no basis to determine that, but there are a couple of considerations worth flagging. Number one, Pegasus says they only sell to governments and government agencies. Uh, and that to those vetted by and approved by the Israeli government. They need an okay from the Ministry of Defense because Pegasus is classified as military grade spyware, as military grade weapon, in fact. The second uh, consideration is if only governments could buy it, then of course there is an entirely fair argument to be made, which I've suggested, that if our government denies it, some other government might be using it to snoop on our people. But that's where the target list comes in. This is not the head of RAW, the chief general, the defense minister, uh, any, any uh, individuals in positions that are, are normally considered to be of interest to foreign governments. These are people whose role and whose interest appear to lie entirely in the political arena. And it seems rather unlikely, or shall we say less likely, that a foreign government would adopt this particular target list um, if it were deploying Pegasus in India. Now, for these two reasons, uh, there is some legitimate concern and suspicion that perhaps the government um, has, has deployed this against Indian citizens. In any case, there is enough grounds for a thorough and serious investigation. Mm -hmm. Let's circle back to the point that you made about legality, sir, because at this point, the only communication we have, both from Mr. Prasad and now from Mr. Vaishnav, 
is that, uh, you know, under the sections of the IT Act and the Telegraph Act, they've gone on to say there are provisions for lawful interception of electronic communication for the purpose of national security. Now I'm playing devil's advocate for a bit and asking you whether something like Pegasus actually per is permitted? I mean, does the act permit the installation of spyware? Is that what the terminology is? What are we looking at from a legal perspective? Okay, so what happened is that the information technology minister, Ashwini Vaishnav, who of course was one of the two ministers um, targeted by Pegasus, uh, he declared briefly in parliament before he was drown drowned out um, by disruptions that any form of illegal surveillance isn't possible in India given the checks and balances in our laws and procedures. He said that under our robust institutions, there's a well-established procedure through which lawful interception of electronic communications is carried out for the purposes of national security. So that immediately looks you to look at where lawful interception is made possible. Now, the Indian government has the power to surveil, monitor, and decrypt communications. Section 5, open brackets 2 of the, of the Indian Telegraph Act, 1885, and Section 69 of the Information Technology Act, 2000 broadly known as the IT Act. So the Telegraph Act and the IT Act both allow for the interception of telephone communications and electronic data. And there are very specific grounds where the interception is permitted. In the interest of the sovereignty and integrity of India, security of the state, friendly relations with foreign states, or for public order, or for preventing incitement to the commission of an offense which is why, why the 2019 WhatsApp cases um, seemed to some to perhaps offer grounds to the government to plead that they were acting uh, illegally, though they didn't claim it at that time. Now, there are two interesting complications here. The first is the exercise of this power was restricted because the Supreme Court issued guidelines in a case called PUCL versus the Union of India back in 1996 saying there are no procedural safeguards uh, in the uh, Telegraph Act, and the, um, uh, we must have a clear set of procedures. Interception can be ordered legally, but it must be ordered by the Home Secretary or the Home Secretaries of State Governments. But these must be sent to a review committee within one week with the details of the number of persons intercepted, and that the period of interception can only be for two months, though that can be renewed by a special decision not beyond six months. And the role of the review committee was then codified under rules uh, of the Indian Telegraph rules, rule 419A, if you want to be uh, aware of that. And, uh, and the problem is, of course, the, the decision is made by a bureaucrat, the Home Secretary, and the review committee itself consists of other bureaucrats, the Cabinet Secretary, the Law Secretary, and the IT Secretary. Mm -hmm. A second big catch, Mittali, is all this is about interception of communications. But what about hacking? Because what we're talking about amounts to hacking. Now, hacking is against the law. Because if you read the Information Technology Act, which is what deals with uh, this sort of thing, Section 43, read with Section 66, says that unauthorized access to a computer device, computer resource, or computer network can attract imprisonment up to three years a fine which may extend to five lakh rupees or both. Now, what exactly is this? Well, in 2000, when the IT Act was passed, you had mobile phones, you didn't have smartphones. So in mobile phones, the assumption at the time the Act was drawn was that essentially it would be people listening into you, which can be legally justified, as I've just explained, for national security grounds. But taking control of devices or hacking them through spyware or malware is actually explicitly disallowed unless you get a very complicated ruling saying that a mobile telephone in your hand, a smartphone, is not a computer device. To my mind and to almost any, any technical definition, of course it's a computer device. And if it's a computer device, then putting something into it is actually an offense under the IT Act. And, 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 and it's also a gross violation of the right to privacy with the Supreme Court has meanwhile recognized in the Pukiswami case. So surveillance using a spyware tool like Pegasus would be basically de facto, ipso facto, illegal. That's mm -hmm. the, the, the essential problem. And this is why I call for an investigation. I'm not a judge, Mitali, and certainly a committee made up 
of MPs, whether it's the IT committee or as some people call for a separate joint uh, committee. The only difference between a because all our committees are joined to both houses. So the only difference between the established standing committees and a joint committee, which simply means the joint, a new select joint committee just on this issue would have to be chaired by the ruling party, whereas the IT committee is chaired by me. So already on the, on the data privacy bill, they thought of this wheeze of taking it out of my committee and putting it on the committee I'm immediately chair. They could do the same here if they wanted to resort to a committee. But my answer is that all of us, however well-intentioned or sincere or professional we are, we are not judges. And the limit, there are limits on the powers of committees. We don't have the kinds of powers that an American or a British parliamentary committee, an American congressional committee or a British parliamentary committee would have. Whereas a judge, for example, could call for evidence, could actually ask you to submit your phone and have it sub subjected to forensic analysis, which no parliamentary committee can do. Um, can also subpoena witnesses, which no parliamentary committee can do. We can summon people on certain limitations, but we have no enforcement powers in our committees. And finally, a judge would be somebody who could actually weigh the evidence uh, and, and come to a conclusion based on it. So for all of these reasons, I, I called from the very outset, the day the scandal arose on the whatever 16th or 17th of July, I said, this needs a Supreme Court monitored investigation. I've stuck to my guns. Uh, ever since. Um, I do want to stress that as far as uh, I'm concerned, this is a serious matter which potentially affects the privacy of every Indian citizen. And that's why it's incumbent upon our government, like every other government mentioned in these things, to take it seriously enough to authorize an investigation. It can be by the Supreme Court. It can be by the um, under the Commission of Inquiries Act. But whatever it is, we need something. And of course, for those um, who are perhaps not up to speed, this has gone to the court. Uh, a second affidavit has been asked for from the government. So that one remains in process. You know, Dr. Thiruri, even assuming for a moment you go with this national security debate, I think what was deeply disturbing was the nature of the individuals targeted. And I, you know, I'm, I'm asking you this as uh, not a politician, but a citizen. What happens when a Supreme Court staffer who has leveled sexual harassment allegations against the then Chief Justice uh, is on that list. Not just her, there's 11 members of her family who are also on that list. What national security risk does an individual like this pose? And more importantly, uh, you know, what is the recourse for an individual such as this? Where is she supposed to go when there is this massive spyware uh, under play for a sexual harassment allegation, which in any case must have taken her a lot to have stood up and called it out. No, I agree with you. It, it really is dismaying, to put it politely, um, that, that such a thing could happen. I, you know, I don't want to, again, jump to conclusions, but again, the fact that this lady and I believe 11 people connected to this matter uh, were all surveilled uh, is, is, is truly, um, I could even use the word shameful. And, and it's a pity because we're looking at something which um, in any case was settled uh, in the interests of the uh, Chief Justice, uh, the then Chief Justice himself, in a process he monitored. And so it, it, it is extremely um, unnecessary to violate the privacy of a victim, uh, or at least shall we say an alleged victim, um, in this manner. I, it's most unfortunate. And the thing is, Again, the thought that keeps coming back is if they can do it in that case, if they can do it in this kind of case, if they can do it to people like that, they can do it to anybody. And that's why no one is truly exempt from the implications of what happened with Pegasus. The um, standard response, often from political parties as well, Dr. Thurur, is that data privacy is seen as an elite issue. It's not something that touches the larger public. But, you know, going back to some of the examples that you raised, when you target somebody like Prashant Kishore in the middle of and through the West Bengal elections, when you target journalists that are reporting on important issues, I mean, is this not corrupt electoral practice? Is this not uh, completely reneging on someone's democratic rights? So that's the, 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 the very serious political aspect of this, which is that um, uh, we all know how important the BJ, uh, how important the Bengal elections were to the BJP. We, we fully understand that this was almost make or break for them. Their prime minister, the home minister, all sorts of people repeatedly came. They even took great risks to the health of the nation 
by their large number of mass rallies and public events at a time when the, 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 the dreaded second wave was beginning. And they did all of this in order to win. And, and clearly, there was a perception that they needed to pull out all the stops, have every bit of advantage they could possibly wrest in this scenario. And one of the advantages they could have is information about what the other side was thinking, what the campaign strategies were, what the, the, the person organizing the campaign uh, wanted to do, intended to do, or, or was telling uh, the chief minister and other party leaders he was doing. And for this reason, um, it's clear Pegasus was deployed. Now, as it turned out, we all know the election results didn't go the way the BJP wanted. But had it gone the way the BJP wanted and this had come out, would it not have vitiated the integrity of the result? Uh, are we going to create a situation in our, in our democracy where the party that happens to be in power can misuse vast sums of, of public money, taxpayers' money, in order to score political points over uh, their, their, their immediate rivals, whether in state elections or in national? These are very serious charges. These are ethically extremely dubious kinds of conduct. And I think, you know, we really ought to call for this um, to, be, to be exposed and dealt with. It's also a slippery slope at this point for India, Dr. Tharoor. I mean, we're talking about Pegasus, but even as, uh, you know, it, it's, it's sort of going towards an investigation, but hitting um, a brick wall. There's so much else that's at play in the Indian landscape. I mean, there was a very casual mention of facial recognition technology being kicked in. There's CMS, NatGrid, uh, Netra. In fact, some of these, I think, are in violation of the Kutusami judgment itself, something that, you know, we are marking as a milestone today. And this is happening in the context where many other nations, including the EU and the US, is actually moving away from this. Um, you know, I guess as an individual citizen, the question you're asking is, uh, is this an inevitable outcome? And what can I do to push back on this? Uh, is it an inevitable outcome? Well, it's in our hands as a democracy and as a society to try and hold to account those who have tried to do this. Um, what, can we, what can we do there is that's where you get into slightly more challenging territory. First of all, the judiciary offers in many ways the best hope because the judiciary may not be very quick in its, in its actions and therefore may not help address the issues that are immediately the subject of our urgent headlines, but it can take the long considered view that is so often absent from the political process. Uh, secondly, uh, and that's, that's, that's one aspect of the whole thing. Secondly, there is the, the, the very legitimate need to balance what we are seeing happening when it comes to the increasing development and, and, and creation of a surveillance state in our country um, versus the understandable requirements in the 21st century for the government to have enough technological mastery over data flows and information, especially involving sensitive foreign countries, terrorists and major criminals, all of which would require the government to have certain capacities, which we would only object to if they were used against lawful and law-abiding citizens. <coughs> How do you strike the balance? Now, it's, it seems clear that if our government did what, what it seems they have done, that the balance was completely lost. But otherwise, I would say a responsible government of India, a country that's in a tough neighborhood and is besieged by various security threats, some of the national security capacities and some of the technological abilities uh, to intercept communications and even eavesdrop on communications from those specific targets, the targets being criminals, terrorists, uh, and, and, and hostile foreign governments, that capacity the Indian government must have. But there's got to be sufficient restraint and public condemnation of deploying that capacity for political purposes or any other petty purposes against the citizens of this country, against people who are simply going about their lawful business. Now, this becomes a, a genuine challenge because, because um, 
by definition, if the capacity is secret, we don't know how it's being deployed. Here we actually have a boon in that this revelation, global revelation, has confirmed that something like this is being deployed in ways in which it was not authorized to and is not permitted by law to be deployed in India. And the question, therefore, is can we use this opportunity? And I include journalists like you, uh, NGOs like the Internet Freedom Foundation, public spirited citizens going to the Supreme Court and so on, everyone who cares about these issues, can we use this to prize open the, the veil of secrecy under which the government wants to conduct its, its, uh, its cloak and dagger business and see whether indeed we can have sufficient teeth to the law so that they can have this capacity but not use it against their own. That's the question. I, I don't have a simple answer, but that's the desirable principle. By the way, for our audience, we're at the half point mark, more or less, with this conversation. So in case there's questions you would like to ask of Dr. Kuru, please start posting them. I will, Sorry, I will have to have a hard stop uh, at, at a minute to five because I have a, at a minute to function five. in my constituency. Well, copy that. Uh, you know, I want to go back to the point you were making, Dr. Thurur, about journalists raising their voice and organizations like IFF raising their voice. Um, there is a feeling that privacy is an alien concept for, um, you know, for, for people within our country. Do you think that that needs a bit of a reset as well? Uh, we need to push back harder. We need to say that, you know what, this is counted as one of our fundamental rights and you cannot go about collecting data uh, without any clear cause uh, or, or outcome. Yes, in fact, uh, the principle that you've just stated is absolutely you know, unarguable. I think we should all follow that principle. Uh, in addition, there's a draft data protection bill that's still being battered around a joint parliamentary committee that is uh, uh, tasked with coming up with comments on the bill. When they have done their report, it then has to go to um, the ministry concerned, then to cabinet, then come back to parliament to be voted. So we are some months away from a conclusion of a process that will lock all this in in a cast iron way to give Indian citizens very clear rights over their own data. In the context of data privacy, I have taken the stand, going back to before I had anything to do with the IT committee, just as an ordinary MP, I've introduced a private member's bill, which of course, like most private members' bills, um, didn't actually get discussed, but a bill in which I proposed uh, two basic principles that we should enshrine in our law that data belongs to he or she who generates it, namely to the citizen, not to the state. That the state may access it for specified purposes and for limited durations of time consistent with that purpose. And thereafter, the data must be destroyed or returned to the person who generated it. And that any disputes will have to be adjudicated by an independent data protection authority, which should consist of a cross section of interest from the judiciary, uh, technology experts, as well as ordinary citizens, consumer user groups. Now, those principles have not been upheld in the government's draft. And uh, in fact, uh, they, have, they have got something they call a data protection authority. But as with the review committee in the IT Act, it essentially is, or the Telegraph Act, it essentially is a bunch of bureaucrats ruling on the decisions of other bureaucrats. Now, I know from my conversations with retired cabinet secretaries that when they are given by the Home Secretary uh, a 15-page list of numbers that the Home Secretary has deemed appropriate uh, to tap or to intercept, they, that is the cabinet secretary, does not in practice have the time to go into a detailed analysis of these numbers and so on uh, in the review process. So cabinet secretary told me very frankly, the, reviews, the, the review process is a farce. Now, can you imagine if you have that kind of approach built into the government's thing, then any interception the government conduct, conducts will automatically be approved by, by uh, the, the data protection authority because it'll literally be a busy bureaucrat uh, overseeing the decisions of another busy bureaucrat. And there would be very little serious time in review being given to this. So I'm hoping that the um, opposition MPs on the Joint Select Committee on the Data Protection Bill will have raised these points. I also wrote officially to the chairman making all these points. 
But at the end of the day, Mitali, we haven't seen what's coming out of that committee. And the short answer is, I don't know what the law will or will not permit. I think we all have a sense of what is desirable for the law uh, to allow and not allow. But what will actually happen, to see. There is one question from the audience, sir, and I think, you know, it sinks in with something that I was going to ask you, because I hear more and more from what you're saying that this is, this has to go to court, this has to find uh, some kind of remedy or solution within the judiciary. Are you saying then that the parliament is at this point unable to resolve this? And the question that's come in is, without help from the media, can the opposition do anything to make the government accountable? Is there any out-of-the-box solution? Well, look, I believe in continuing to try and do my duty, uh, which is to convene another meeting as soon as possible. The speaker had requested that he be given time to meet with the committee members and see whether he could cooperate, get them all to cooperate. Uh, he did not, in the end, find it possible to hold such a meeting. Um, we have now a previously scheduled committee tour, uh, which is an annual exercise of every parliamentary committee. So during that time, uh, we will be uh, roaming around the country for the next 10 days. But subsequent to that, I think it's likely we will need to try and meet again. But do not forget the last time that a meeting was attempted, the majority party, um, well, two last times. On one occasion, they tried to prevent discussion. On the second occasion, they tried to uh, deny the meeting a quorum and that they clearly have instructed the three secretaries to government concerned in tandem to find reasons not to come, all of which does not actually offer much hope that the parliamentary committee will be able to discuss this uh, in, in, you know, with much ease. And the, the honest truth is that in any other democracy, the ruling party would be shamed by the public and by the media if they tried to behave in this way and thwart a discussion. Our country, um, the issue warranted a very minor mention in the papers and and, and very little awareness of how earth-shaking it was for one party to essentially, in government, of course, to essentially tell the bureaucracy not to cooperate with the Parliament Committee. In any other parliamentary democracy, this would be a resigning offence on the part of serious senior officials. It, it's, it's utterly shocking that we have such um, low levels of expectations, it seems, from our system. Um, now, there's one more technical issue. The mandate of the Parliament Committee is actually renewed every year, and the, the committee's mandate comes up for renewal on the 12th of September. You're aware that one particularly obstreperous member has repeatedly and publicly, through letters released from the press, called for my, re for my removal as chairman. Um, so uh, it, it is not at all guaranteed that uh, after the 12th of September that I will be in a position to deliver um, uh, the approved agenda of the committee uh, on these issues um, and allow it to proceed and do its work. Uh, to my mind, we're looking at potentially a, a sort of crisis when it comes to adopting uh, or readopting the agenda for the following year. And um, one will really have to see how all this goes. I don't want to presume on anything. I um, have been doing my job with integrity and with, with honesty. I've been very clear when I speak in a personal capacity, and I've been uh, disapproving of the orchestrated leaks from the committee by people who are hostile to the committee's work. But I have tried at the same time uh, to trick, take the committee along. I have five years experience as chairman of the External Affairs Committee, where we dealt with very sensitive issues without the slightest disagreement or dissent or not a single dissent note ever being recorded as we unanimously adopted reports uh, that have, I believe, stood the test of time. And the IG committee has turned out to be somewhat more problematic and we'll have to see how that goes. There is uh, another development of the last four years, Dr. Kuhl, which is the slow but uh, quite apparent crumble of the federal structure, whether it is in terms of economic cooperation or what happened at the peak of COVID between states and the center. And one suggestion that's been put forth is that perhaps states, just like West Bengal and the chief minister there have done, should go ahead and start independent inquiries of their own. Do you think that's another way to galvanize force and opinion uh, in this regard? Should states start you know, conducting investigations on their own into Pegasus? And well, what they, you know? 
my understanding is that the constitutionality of that matter is already up before the courts. That is that can a state government, which undoubtedly seems to have been a victim of this process, conduct a judicial inquiry which would necessarily involve central government agencies uh, and which would also seem to be in an area of nationwide communications that are the domain of the central government on the, on the, on the, on the central list. Now, I'm not a lawyer, I'm certainly not a judge, and I'm not going to presume on the outcome, but it's very um, easy to construct an argument that if every state government felt free uh, to, to set up such inquiries that you would essentially have legal chaos on some issues. Uh, now, I hope that that's not the conclusion because I think all of us feel that as long as the center is unwilling to conduct an inquiry, we feel that at least someone is doing it. But it also may be difficult for the state government, for example, to compel cooperation from a central government official who is instructed by his own prime minister or home minister or minister to not cooperate. I mean, how do you resolve the standoff? It, it's a very complicated issue, Mithali, that I don't think anyone has simple, straightforward answers to. Am I wrong, Dr. Tharoor, in reading um, a tone of resignation in your voice about this issue uh, in terms of you know, what the parliament or the political process can do, whether or not we can even have a conversation about you know, a personal privacy charter? Uh, I, are you feeling resigned uh, by the process? Are you feeling hemmed in by the process? Or do you think no, that- uh, yeah. Not resigned. I don't, I'm not a giver upper. I'm not a quitter, but I am. Uh, incredibly frustrated. Perhaps what you're hearing is the frustration coming in uh, through my voice. I was looking at some of the questions in the chat room, yeah. and and one of them talks about how the united opposition could do, could do something in the parliamentary standing committee on the pregnancy issue. I should stress that the committees all reflect the actual balance of the house uh, of the houses. So in this case, uh, we have an overwhelming BJP majority in every parliamentary committee. So once the ruling party is absolutely determined there should be no, no discussion, uh, even on the most flagrant potential uh, violations on any issue. Uh, it becomes entirely feasible uh, for a majority to prevent discussion as we have seen uh, as recently as the Pegasus problem. I am mindful of the fact that uh, you, you have a time limit going. So let me wind down by asking you a question where sum up to you know in, in your mind what is it that a victim should be doing and an ordinary citizen should be doing Dr. Tharoor? because for the victim it says go to court you know file a case in uh, in the police uh, push this uh, but it seems like recourse is quite limited what do you do as a victim what do you do as an individual citizen at this point to really safeguard privacy as a concept as a victim i think you should go to the supreme court that I, that's my personal view and i've advised those are the people uh, whom I know to have been targeted to do precisely that, because as I mentioned fairly early in our conversation with Ali, I do believe the judiciary offers the best recourse to actually get into the bottom of what happened, uh, much more than any other institution in our system. Uh, the investigating agencies are under the central government and parliament uh, has the limitations we already talked about. So the judiciary is the answer. What can the individual citizen do? There you really end up with some resignation. And the answer probably is nothing. Because at least with the WhatsApp um, leak, and the WhatsApp vulnerability that was probed by Pegasus sending a missed call, uh, apparently the technique was to send a missed video call on WhatsApp. You would answer it, the person would hang up, and then Pegasus was in your phone. So there, at least in theory, you can tell people, never answer a missed video call from somebody you don't know or, or just, you know, take away WhatsApp, use some other device to communicate because WhatsApp is vulnerable, whatever. Now, the problem is that Pegasus has become so sophisticated now that they don't need any of those techniques. Yeah. Apparently, they're able to put themselves on your phone now without recourse to a missed call, without the user having to click anything. And so you can't, data, so. Yeah, so, so you can't even warn a user you know, for God's sake, don't click on an unknown link, the usual stuff we get on the internet. Uh, because in fact, with Pegasus, even that doesn't save you. So uh, I try basically to take recourse in the feeling that essentially, um, I should proceed on the operating assumption that anything I'm saying or writing on my telephone uh, is potentially in the hands of people who don't particularly care about it. 
But since my conscience is clear that I'm not doing anything anti-national, I'm not conspiring with terrorists, uh, and, and, and I'm not uh, uh, contemplating the commission of any crime, uh, I basically told myself, let them see it. I can't spend all my time worrying about it. Now, I know that sounds like a slight bit of resignation. There is nothing I can do. Uh, but you tell me, Mitali, what is that? You should have the answer, sir. <laughs> You're sitting in Parliament. I can only ask you the questions. <laughs> but, all right. Well, then the answer is I don't think that it's reasonable for us to ask any individual citizen of India to take any particular precautions. I mean, I think we've seen Mamta Banerjee putting a tape on her phone camera. I'm not sure that's going to prevent uh, these folks from getting into her phone if they want to. So my advice is we, we essentially say that um, we have to use a judicial route to bar certain kinds of snooping by the government, to make it impossible and illegal and with severe consequences uh, for them to do anything. Uh, because, you know, it's both illegal, as I mentioned, and it's unethical because it's a misuse of taxpayers' money for the narrow partisan political interests of, of the ruling party. That, too, is something that the public ought to disapprove of. I must say, I am surprised at how much the issue has died down in one month and how now outside specialized circles like uh, this forum organized by the Internet Freedom Foundation, how little discussion there is anymore of Pegasus. Uh, the government uh, may, may well have calculated that if they drag this on long enough, people won't care. Uh, and, and, you know, mood of the nation polls and all of this kind of stuff that's going on um, have not even made a big issue about whether people do believe the government should be held to account for what happened on Pegasus. So, you know, our democracy is as robust as we, the people of India, make it. If we are essentially complicit in the undermining of our own democracy, then uh, who, do we, who do we turn to for succor? It's ourselves, it's our own country, it's our own system. If we're essentially saying the government can do all this and get away with it, there we are. Not much we can do. And of course, when we turn to the judiciary, we also uh, turn with the hope, Dr. Tharoor, that uh, they are above this, uh, which as recent events have shown, perhaps may not be the case. This was a sobering conversation indeed. We really appreciate your time and your thoughts and your patience for taking on all those questions. And we wish you luck for the standing committee. <laughs> We're hoping that there is some light for this issue over there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mitali, Apar and the Internet Freedom Foundation.